that. Uh, thanks so much, Scarlett. It's, it's really good to be here this morning. I know Monday mornings are a little difficult for most of us, but um, it's a beautiful day. It's a little bit rainy, kind of wet outside, but um, it's just still great to be here with you all. Um, as Scarlett mentioned, my name is Pamela Reed, and I am currently the Managing Director of Community Programs at the Venture Center. Uh, I previously worked at the ASB TDC, but in most of the roles that I've had at both of these entrepreneurial support organizations has been to help coordinate, uh, you know, training for entrepreneurs and events, making sure that I was able to facilitate, uh, provide one-on-one -on -one consulting services, as well as access or information about resources that are available. Uh, prior to working in the entrepreneur support arena, I also worked as a business communications teacher at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, and I was a consultant at Verizon Wireless. And so my experience is a combination of many things, but I think they're all beneficial as it relates to what we're going to talk about today, which is business planning. Um, there's a big part of business planning that has to do every bit with the um, the kind of, you know, the disposition of the person who's wanting to start the business. And for so long, people have believed that um, this starving art artist persona was a real thing. And so today we're going to talk about why it's just a myth for that. We're not going to talk extensively, but I'm going to show you through our discussion that it's just a myth. Um, when you start a business, business is about making money. And often when you're an artist, you are in an art business, whether you're doing it part time, whether you're doing it, you know, as a contract based on a contract basis, it, it's a business for you. Um, so we're going to get into all of that here in just a second. Um, let me make sure. All right. So one of the reasons um, you need a business plan is because for one, it's a living, breathing document that helps you take all of the different ideas that you have about your business and put them in one place so that you can go back and refer back to it from time to time. It helps you think about things that you hadn't considered and clarify um, some of the more specific business aspects that you'll need to to make sure that you're making money and not just breaking even or losing money in the process. You will refer back to your business plan from time to time to try to make updates as you learn more about your target customers, as you learn more about your business, as you learn more about what products sell in the market. So always kind of refer back to your business plan. It becomes your document to guide and navigate how you run your business. So it also helps you to identify benchmarks. Um, there is a financial piece of the business plan as well as operational um, plan in the business plan as well, which Tell, you know, you have an opportunity to dictate what's going to happen in 12 months, what's going to happen in three years, what's going to happen in 10 years or five years, or what I predicted that my finances would be X, but instead they're Y, what changed, you know, so a business plan gives you an opportunity and forces you to sit down and think about how all of these aspects of your business are working together so that you can continue to make improvements and evaluate your progress and see where you're making money. It is a management tool for making decisions. Again, you'll see, you know, from when we look at uh, the income statement, for example, you know, if you're, if you're actually documenting all of your expenses and how all of the money is going out and how all of your money is coming in and using contracts to kind of regulate how uh, the customer journey is or how that process works all together, then what's going to happen is, is you're going to be able to identify those areas that you have more opportunities and the ones that you don't. And in a situation like that, then if you find an area that you have more opportunity, you do more of that to make more money. If you find an area that doesn't or you thought it did and it did not then you know to stop doing those things so it's a good tool for making decisions in addition it helps you kind of refine your customer approach um, and it, it also helps you to introduce the business to other people now we won't talk a whole lot about getting loans today but we'll talk about um, you know 
from a bootstrapping standpoint as well. We'll, we'll try to incorporate both of those. But often when we start a small business, we have investors, our family members or whomever else, or we may decide that we want to go out and get a brick and mortar. And so we have a landlord. Um, maybe we have a supplier that we, if, if they see our business plan and they see the vision, then potentially they may decide to give us a discount on buying bulk materials. And so it's a, it's a way to introduce your business to um, different stakeholders with the benefit of them being able to work with you and give you what you need to for your business. And then lastly, it helps also in terms of employees. So for example, when we start out, sometimes we don't sit down and write a business uh, employee handbook. And so um, when we're bringing those folks on, the extra help, the contractors and all of those folks, then based on how you've written your business plan, it may provide a vision for how you want to operate the business so that they will also know how they need to proceed and get on board with your plans and your ideas to make sure you can reach your goals. So today we're going to talk about, are you ready to be a full-time art in a, in a full-time art business? Um, we're going to talk about how to write a business plan, and then we're going to get into a few of tools and resources. All right, so before I start, does, are there any questions? No? Okay, so what happens, and, and ideally this slide is one that would be for a a starting your business, and some of you may already be in business, um, and you're actually here to write a business plan because that was a step you neglected or you didn't have time to do, and you need to go back and grab that information because now you're growing and you're trying to get to the next step. But then there are some of you who are saying, hey, I've been doing this art thing part-time for a long time, and now I think I do want to turn it into a business. I got to get my ideas out of my head and on paper because I really want to go to the bank and get money. I feel so passionate about art right now <clears throat> that it's just time. Okay. And so think about your motivations um, for, for wanting to start the art business because there are some people that are just thinking, hey, I just don't want to work a nine to five and I'm, I'm just need to do my art full time because I don't want to deal with people. I just want to deal with me. And so in cases like that, you know, when you stack your bills up against the actual expenses for starting an art business, does that math work out? Because are you able to afford all of those expenses? And if you're able to afford all of those expenses, then you may be in a great position to start an art business. But then there are some people who have to look at it a little different and say, okay, well, I've been doing this art thing full time. And if I devote more time to it, then I think it can support me so that I don't have to work a nine to five job. And in a situation like that, it may make sense for the, the money from the nine to five job to actually support the, the expenses of the art business initially. It even may even make sense for you to go part-time and work and do both to make sure that when you stack up those personal expenses with the expenses of actually producing the uh, product or service, then it may make sense for you to stay part-time so that you can float your income. So think about your motivations for what, why you wanna start Everything is not carte blanche as it relates to starting a business. A lot of people start their business. They bootstrap. They begin with their 401k. They begin with money from friends and family or whomever else so that, you know, they don't have to go and take out a loan. And the financial piece is a huge piece of starting a business. You've got to know where the money is going to come from to initially get you started for your budget your working capital, and a few other things, which we'll talk about later. The responsibility piece is also like a major factor. Um, you know, a lot of people want to start a business, but not everybody's got has what it takes to be responsible enough to do the administrative work and actually work with people. Um, starting a business is not pie in the sky. It is uh, it's not going to be that you can work when you want to unless you've got a pot of cash or a pot of gold someplace. Um, but it's more of a something that you're going to have to devote your whole self to. And so I think the complexity of being an artist starting a business is, is that some artists are starting their business because they want to put everything they have into what they're passionate about, which is their art. 
but that business is going to require so much, so much of, of your time and attention. Then now you have a struggle between running the business and also producing the art. And so that responsibility piece becomes really, really significant. Um, it does require time management. It does require making sure that you um, block time off to do certain things and that you decide what's important and what's an emergency and what's some things that can wait till later. And are these things that I can delegate or, you know, you have to figure out how to manage um, to make sure that you can do both, create your art and run your business. So getting into the business uh, plan, there are um, probably about 11 or 12 components that we're going to just touch on real briefly. And then, I'll, and there are some of those components that I will flush out as I kind of go through everything. But your cover page is the first piece that people will see. It definitely needs to have your name, um, the business name, and your contact information, maybe your social handles, your website. And then if you have a non-disclosure agreement, you want to have it there as well. Then you have your table of contents. Um, and in your table of contents, that's pretty much just a map of, you know, where people can find things, because what happens with a business plan is, you know, if you, if you focused on quality over quantity, because there are several business plan models out there, um, you can pick one that is more focused for artists, um, that's going to talk a little bit more about your pricing and your customer journey and things like that. Or you can pick one that's uh, more specific to banking needs and it's going to focus more on your financial statements and your budget and things like that. So you definitely want to have a table of contents because often when you're presenting your business plan to stakeholders, they're going to want to skim. They're not going to want to read your business plan from cover to cover. Now, if you focused on quality over quantity, then you probably have about eight to 10 pages. And even with that, it helps that if, if a bank loan officer is trying to find information in your business plan because their loan board, for example, may have asked them a question about, okay, well, I see that they're trying to sell widgets, but I don't understand how the selling of these widgets is going to be enough for them to get uh, to pay back this loan. And so it may become necessary for your bank loan officer to go in and figure out what your process is, what's unique about your widgets, what's so different that you're going to sell more widgets than the 15 other people who are selling widgets. And so, you know, he doesn't want to look through your whole, read your whole plan just to find out what your process is for customers to buy products. Your executive summary is another piece. Now, although it's pretty early on in the business plan, it is a summary of everything in the business plan. So you're gonna write that last. And it's truly what it is. It is a summary, a high level summary that gives um, stakeholders or whomever is reading that business plan, a quick and dirty outlook of what's really happening. And it's one that's, that they should understand. They should understand what your company is, who you are, what you're trying to sell, how are you going to sell it, how are you going to market it, and what your numbers look like. It should be easy to define, define that from the executive summary. You're going to have a company description. And this is, this is so, this seems so minute, but I will tell you, I have read enough business plans that it's amazing how people don't really describe what they do. What do you do and how do you do it? And what is unique about what you do? There needs to just be a clear understanding of that piece. I need to know if you're a sole proprietor. I need to know if you're an LLC. I need to know if you're a corporation. Those things should be included in your company description. Your product or service, again, that's going to be like hand in hand with your company description. It should be a clear explanation of what you are providing and the gap it feels. And if it feels a gap that other products or services are filling, okay, what's different about how you're filling it in some cases? Now, I know we're talking about art today, but even still, there's a need to, there's, there's a lot of explanation that can go in there. 
All right, um, financial proposal. You're gonna talk about your budget. You're gonna talk about your pricing and your financial projections. If you do decide to go to the bank, most banks are gonna want uh, financial projections up to 12 to 36 months. And then they still may, um, you know, kind of give you a little bit of trouble and want more information. But that's you actually saying, based on what I believe about my business, here's what I think I can do. And this is where market research comes into play quite a bit. Management and operations, who's running this company and are they qualified? What do they know about the industry that you're trying to go into? Okay, and in some cases you may be working with contractors to do a large part of your work, but it's, it's important enough to put that piece of information in there because that is part of your management plan. Marketing, uh, you, who's your target customer? Who's your target customer? And this could vary, you know, most of us feel like, okay, the target customer is everybody when it comes to art. But then, and sometimes it takes time to refine and find out, you know, who's purchasing the most of my art? And what am I selling? Am I selling $3,000 paintings or am I selling $20 um, caricatures? Which is more preferred? Which is what gonna get me to the money that I need to make a living if I decide to be a full-time art business? And the market analysis. Now, there are many, many pieces to the market analysis, um, but some of it includes the industry. Some of it includes your competition. It's going gonna, it's gonna to include all of those forces that are deciding and forcing you into how you're going to sell products or services and where the industry is going as well. The operation plan is an outline of st strategic company goals. And basically, what the business plan says is, hey, high level, these are all the things that I'm going to do, but here's how I'm going to do it in the operation plan. Let's put it all into action here. And then if you have any additional documents that's being requested by the bank, or maybe there are some pieces of art or something that you might need to show or credentials that you need to show as an artist, this is where they would go in the appendix. So what I really want you to understand about all of those areas that I talked about is that it really is about telling a story. Um, when I started working on going to school in 2016, my, my whole goal was to become a writer. And so in teaching business communications and just communicating in general, the story narrative is significant. And so when you're doing your business plan, you're telling a story on paper. Every single thing you write down connects. Every single thing that you talk about can build on the thing that you talked about prior to it to help readers to not start over with every single paragraph trying to understand your business, but to help them refine and get a better understanding of your business by building on what you've already stated. Okay, but in different ways and in different focus. All right, so here's a cover page, and I'm sorry, this, this is a little bit blurry. This um, image that says Immaculate Cleaning Services, it's complements of the ASBTDC, which is definitely going to be one of your resources, and I'll talk about them a little bit later. But again, company name. If you have a logo, make sure you put that on there. Put all your phone numbers, your physical address, your email address, your website, and then if you have a confidentiality statement, it should be the first page of your business plan. And nobody should ever question where the business plan came from and who it is for. Your executive summary is, like I stated before, it is a summary of the contents of your plan. It's written last. It's usually about one to two pages, but it's usually the first page of your business plan. Um, it may be the only page that a loan officer reads, so you want to make sure that the details that are important get in there. And basically, when I say that, I don't want to just brush over the fact that we're going to talk about target customers and your market and all of those things earlier, but I want you to think about the same thing when you're writing. So, for example, who are you writing for in some cases? Now, you can write your business plan in a high-level way that it can be used for multiple different um, 
people that you want to tell about your business. But if you are particularly writing for someone at the bank, or you know that your business plan is about to be presented by, to someone at the bank, what do they need to know? What, put yourself in their shoes. What's going to be the most important aspect of what they're making a decision on about your, about your business plan or about your business? And nine times out of 10, they're just concerned about whether or not that you can pay that money back. OK, so you want to focus on the numbers and how you've designed the business so that you can get the numbers if you're talking to a bank. But if you're talking to another group, like, for example, um, if your if your art has some type of socially conscious uh, piece that needs to be communicated or maybe it's going to be you want it to be displayed at a particular um, museum or children's venue that has a consistent value system to yours, then, then you might want your business plan to actually speak to that piece, that value piece of it. So what I'm saying is, is we don't want to put a lot of fluff in here, but we want to be mindful of what we're trying to accomplish with the business plan and all of the avenues that may potentially be available. And so to do that, we have to put ourselves in the shoes of the customer. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, we have a question here from Norwood. Um, often with artists, the plan often evolves from the inspiration from the art first, not the product. Um, spectrums of offerings help void the income. If you plan uh, art as a biz regular business, it is possible to fall into the trap or the, I'm sorry, the pet of a corporate operation, soulless and motivated by the money. I guess that's true. I've, I immediately thought of Thomas Kincaid, but somebody's probably a fan, so I apologize. <laughs> How would you advise an artist to balance soul and spiritual practice related to the making process um, in with the business plan? So I guess, how do you avoid that? Yeah, so I think number one is you, you got to know your motivations. And usually when you use the word business, your def it equates to money. There's no way around that. If, if, if you're not trying to make money, you're, you're not really in business, business. So, so your goal in business is to make money. And so as it relates to having a value centered art business, I do think that that's where your goals and who you are need to, and your authenticity needs to be written into your business plan. I do think that that's where you decide who you want to partner with and how you want to make money. And also keep in mind, there are some people who do want to go and grow and have that corporate business. But then there are some people who figure, but I feel like it's enough just to have what I need, just enough. And I think it speaks to that starving artist persona in some cases. But some of it is the authenticity of the person. So I think when it comes to putting your soul in the art, I think that, um, and this is me on a, on, a, on a spiritual level, you know, I think that you have to block off time. And I think you have to find time for spirituality, meditation, creativity, all of those things. And then you have to block off time to work for the business. I think in some ways, the way that we've set them up in society, there's a contradiction there that shouldn't be. Um, and we have to figure out a way to really resolve it for ourselves. And I don't know if I've answered your question, but I've tried. <laughs> I, th I think you did. I, th I think that's really, that's really great. You're right. Um, I mean, if you're starting a business, you kind of need the money in order to keep doing the business. Anything else? Okay, I'll keep going then. All right. Um, so after the executive summary, we usually have our products and service section. And, um, you know, it's what you plan to sell. You know, where do you plan to sell it? Is it going to be online? Is it going to be a storefront? Is it going to be an office or a boutique? And what I found with a lot of new entrepreneurs is that um, the, the wear piece gets a little bit tricky too because entrepreneurs feel like um, 
hey, I got this great stuff. You know, we think about the images and stuff we've seen on television. I'm going to just get me a huge gallery or a huge place. And then I'm just going to sell like crazy because I created it. They're going to come. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, you know, the wear gets to be a little bit tricky because you want to have a specific trade area. Every single artist or every single business has a trade area, a place where they're doing business. And even though being online is the World Wide Web, there are still different locations online. So you may find that you sell more art or um, your product in a group, or you may find that um, you find you 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 know have worked on search engine opt optimization and that because someone visited um, the Children's Art Museum and an ad or something that you had out there popped up that now that leads to another sale. And so, you know, online and brick and mortar, you know, people want to think about them as cut and dry. They're just two different things, but each one of them has a particular trade area. Um, and that means there's an area that you can mark off in some cases on a map where these are the people you're going to be able to reach because these are the ones that you can target. These are the ones that um, are in this in the mindset, the psychographics that you need. They're interested in art. They can afford your art. There is a certain number of uh, pieces that go into that. And so when we start thinking about trade areas, brick and mortars have to think a little bit more about foot traffic and the number of people coming by or the number of businesses that are similar close by that people that are already interested in buying from this well-established business can find out about my business just because they're in the area. Um, there are a lot of different things there. So think about your trade area. Think about where you want to sell your products. Um, I think I came across a website called Artwork Archive and, you know, they boasted about having a tool that was available for artists so that they could actually present their material through image online and then also be able to sell it. So it in itself, that artwork archive was a location where if I'm an avid art buyer and that's what I like to do, or if I'm maybe even a broker who works with people who are trying to buy art, then if that's one of my resources that I'm going to go to immediately, then that's a whole location on its own. OK, so think about where you want to sell. Do your research and find out where people are buying the art that you sell or similar art that you sell. OK, think about your pricing strategy. This is so, so, so important because with your pricing strategy, again, you're trying to make money so that you can provide a living for yourself. And so you have to price your art high enough so that you can take care of yourself. And so think about the money that goes into it. How much are the expenses? How much does it cost to get um, get those materials to you? Is there a shipping cost associated with it? Um, is there some pre work that needs to be done by someone else in the chain of getting um, your pro in your business process chain? Are are there uh, packaging? Is there packaging that may need to take place? Uh, is there a fee that you have to place to pay to get this? product online. And so you want to think about all of those different expenses and then identify how much you can sell your product for to make money. And then if you're and then when when we talk about what need or problem does your product or service address, you know, I know that gets a little bit tricky with art, but at the same time, we buy art because of self-expression. We, we buy art because we want to connect. We want to be a part of other people and other things. And so when I think about the need or problem that it addresses, it depends on the individual. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, I just had a, a question. I know that some of the people we have in our workshop today are performing artists. One's a musician, one's a dancer. And I was hoping you could maybe uh, talk about how we can reframe not just visual arts and an actual product, but like performance or creating something that's um, like freelance writing. I know that 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 can be a business. Dancing can be a business. Um, so I, I didn't want people to think that it was just this one um, craft or um, visual arts. Would you mind speaking about that? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, it, it's Mostly everything that I've talked about is still it still applies. It, it, there's there's no difference in it in the sense of you're providing a service instead of a product. 
And so when we start thinking about the um, what you plan to sell, you know, what are you selling? You're, you're selling your, your expertise. You're selling your, the beauty of watching you dance and cultivate something that other people may or may not find difficult. So if, if, who are those people that want to experience that? How much are they willing to pay today? What goes into that? How much do you, t- do you have to pay for studio time? How much do you have to pay for contracts? If you're a, a performing artist, uh, like a singer or even a pianist, how much do you have to get in lawyers involved with that process? Because if lawyers are involved, then what kind of fees are associated with it over time? You know, so there, there are things, you know, like that, that you want to consider. You, um, if you decide to do something with a, a group or, a, you know, you know, or a someone that's already well established, you know, there are costs associated with that as well. Um, You can also equate your time with a uh, hourly wage. And that's what a lot of uh, performing artists do. The the U.S. Department of Labor, I believe, is the organization. I think 2458 is the uh, rate that artists, and these are visual artists, and so they've probably got some numbers for performing artists as well, but 2458 is the hourly wage that they usually uh, baseline their self with to start to establish their pricing strategy. And so as a performing artist, you know, how much are you being paid when you're asked to be part of a collective of some sort, especially if you're doing it full time? Okay. So as far as the, the problem that your product may address or whatever the case may be, um, it could vary. It just depends. It just depends on the contract and, and the need and the desire of the organization that's trying to carry out the work. Scarlett, did that get into the van? Yes, yes, thank you so much. I think you're frozen, or maybe I am. I'm not sure. She's frozen. Oh, okay. Okay. (laughs) Um. Oh, she's back. Okay. I. Sorry, you were frozen. I'll just go ahead and. Oh, you're muted. Scarlet. Yes, ma'am. You're back. What was the last thing you heard? Last thing I heard. The last thing you heard. Myself. Oh. <laughs> I had just gotten done telling you that that answered the question about oh, musicians. Oh, no. And so that was the last thing I heard. <laughs> That's okay. 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 So what I what I was saying about the performers and the musicians is that it's very, very similar. So like, you know, thinking about what you sell and um, how you sell it in, in the sense of... Um, you know, you want to make sure that you're, where are people buying this particular type of art? You want to make sure that you're connecting with the venues or the locations or the groups or whomever that are already established or where people buy art because people are people. And so people get used to buying things at a certain location, a certain place, and um, that's where they want to consume it. It's the same thing if you're a writer. So, you know, if you're a comic book writer, for example, um, you know, there's a certain publication that people go to for comics. And then there are certain publications that people go to for news. And so when you start thinking about the, the, the way those different types of genres are being uh, distributed, it's the same thing when we start talking about art and artistry. So like, you know, 
go where those people are um, in that particular trade area and find out how to connect to the groups or resources that you need, need to to be successful. And so on the pricing strategy, what I was trying to say was is that um, the, our, the U.S. Department of Labor, they actually have a base pay set for artists. Um, and there's this, this amount is for visual artists, but they have it also for performing arts and other genres. But $24.58 is usually the base pay amount. And so when we start thinking about the time that we put into everything, um, in creating our pricing strategy, we want to make sure that we are putting our time cost as well in paying ourselves, um, in addition to paying for things like our contracts, or if we have to buy additional shoes, or if we needed to get a piano rekeyed, or if we need a special microphone because of COVID, so that we'll have our own microphone, um, you know, things like any type of equipment for a horn or Think, you know, we want to just include all of those different um, costs when we start thinking about the pricing strategy. And then when it comes to the need or the problem um, that they're addressing, I think that that is also consistent with the B2B needs or the needs of the organization that they're working with. And in some cases, it's B2C. I'm Pam Reed. The need or problem that I might need addressed from a musician is that I need that musician to come and play for my wedding because I don't have any music. Or like, for example, if I am a ballet, if I do ballet, then maybe my my the need or problem I'm addressing is the, for the business in the sense of B2B, where the Arkansas Symphony Orchestra may need a ballet about uh, someone who does ballet to play along with their music or something of that nature. So it, it's all in how you frame the, the, the need or problem as it relates to performing art and services. So when we start thinking about management operations, um, you know, a lot of us are solo entrepreneurs or uh, individual art business owners. And so, but we still need to think about all of those people we contract with to try to make our business a success. Because at the end of the year, we still have to file taxes. Uh, you know, we got to figure out what to do with our money because if we're pulling money out of 401k or out of our job or our savings, you know, it would be beneficial to have someone to help us structure what those finances look like to make sure they're working the hardest for us. For most artists, you need an attorney. Um, that's, that's just it. You need an attorney that can help you with contracts. You need an attorney that can help you with any type of copyright, um, understanding that you need to, you know, put forth uh, I, I just say you need an attorney to help advise to make sure that your intellectual property is protected. A technology consultant is beneficial because today, most people feel like a business doesn't exist unless they're online or have some sort of social media presence. And so if, if you're not savvy enough to do your own, um, you may want to have somebody else to build you a website or uh, do consistent posts on social media so customers know where to find you, um, that sort of thing. Someone to help with your insurance uh, and a mentor. And I always include a mentor here because um, mentors are so underrated, but the better the Small Business Administration, you know, has made a statement that this is probably the most untapped resource to help small businesses grow. And so um, having someone that can kind of, that has been there, that can kind of walk you through the process is uh, very, very beneficial and, and talk to you specifically about your business needs. And then compensation and incentives and organizational chart, those are two areas that are uh, more so there for businesses that would like to grow and scale. And when we start thinking about the organization of the business, again, depending on if you're needing to work with the bank or someone else, they're going to want to know, are you qualified to run this type of business? And so if you know that you're trying to start a business in an area that you don't have any experience in, then it, it helps sometimes to have 
a manager or someone to help with the certain areas that you don't have that particular experience. It just looks better. It looks good in a business plan. These are the questions that are likely going to be asked. So when we start talking about um, finances, uh oh, um, there are a few different areas. One is the budget, and we I've talked a lot about the different inventory, equipment, deposits. You know, are you going to have any working capital needs, that sort of thing. Um, the projections are going to be a big piece for yourself and also for if you're deciding that you want to go try to get money from somebody else. Um, 12 to 36 months is a good place to start. It doesn't mean that you won't go back and refine those areas, but it is a great place to start. There are some financial documents that will be needed. Um, a balance sheet. Now, I'm going to say these financial documents are going to be needed only if you're probably trying to go and do business with the bank, okay? Because the most important piece is going to be your statement of cash flows and your income statement if you're working individually for your own self and your own needs there. Pricing, how much do you need to sell your products for to make a living? And that's pretty simple. All right, so what we see here is kind of a budget. This is compliments of the ASB TDC, just a little snapshot from a tool that they have called to the point business plan. This is a sample of that tool. And um, as you can see, it's it's a pretty, pretty, it's a pretty easy breakdown of what your financial statement should look like. So sorry, your financial suppose, proposal should look like. It's gonna show the owner's capital investment. As you can see, they invested 14,000 there, um, but they need 25,000 overall. So they're asking the bank for um, almost $10,000 in this case. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, they're asked, their working capital is 14,000. I'm sorry, I misread that. But as you can see there, they have their um, equipment that they've bought, the cleaning supplies, their office supplies, any fees and deposits they may have had to pay, and that's usually consistent with utilities and things like that. Um, and then their what their working and capital cost. Now that working capital cost is basically how much they're having to pay people and potentially pay themselves. Okay. So basically what they're saying, and, and this is what I like about this business plan, is that they're giving a down and dirty look at their lead generation model. And so what they expect or how they're projecting to have businesses, have their business grow over a period of time. So they're starting off with three churches and they're charging the churches per square foot. And they anticipate that they're going to clean four times per month. And that should equate to about 4000 in revenue. The next month, they're hoping to have four churches. Okay. Still, that square footage model and 5600 Okay. Then in November. So their, their plan is to add one church per month. They've got some information about expenses where they're determined by contracting vendors and utilities and so forth. And so they give a really, really good breakdown of how their budget is gonna work and how much money they're needed and needing and what they're gonna do with it. This is a, an example of the financial statement. I won't show you the balance sheet, but the balance sheet shows you um, basically the status of the company at one specific time, but it gives you a good view of the owner's equity and also the expenses just really as a snapshot in a sheet. Your statement of cash flows shows what cash is available in the business at any given time. And the great thing about that is that's what, um, you know, stakeholders and banks are going to often use to determine whether or not you could pay back a loan. Now, this is the income statement. This pretty much shows your profit and loss for a particular period. And this is about a year, amount, year's amount of time. But it shows you the gross profit, that 4000 we talked about in July, August, 
moving up to the 5,600 in September, October, and adding that one church per month until they're making nearly 16,000 per month. They're showing you all of the expenses here and the net operating income. And so you'll have your own documents. And so you'll work with a CPA or you'll work with um, someone specifically that will, elect, will help you set these documents up for your business. This is just an example of one. All right, so let's get into the market. The thing about the market that I think that a lot of people, you know, there are a lot of people doing everything. <laughs> You know, there's always somebody doing something that has already, you know, we have an idea. Usually there's some variation of it that's already been done. And so we're trying to figure out, well, is it worth me going into the market? How can I get a share of these customers when I may be competing against a, a Lowe's or a Home Depot or, um, you know, a Hobby Lobby or some larger retailer? And my answer is that, you know, is that I personally feel like there's enough room for everybody, but at the same time, you know, it's about how we brand and market ourselves in the conversation. And so when we started thinking about our target market, we want to be as clear as possible um, who we're trying to sell products and services to. And we might not know today. You know, and maybe it's a, about customer discovery over a period of time that we start to identify and find out who our target market is. Um, but we, we definitely want to try to hone in on it because people buy products based on whether or not those products speak to who they are in some cases. Um, let's see how I can best say this. People buy products based on what they feel in most cases and then back it up with logic. So if I see a piece of art based on how that art makes me feel, if I see a ballerina on, let's say I see a ballerina on YouTube in an advertisement and it feels graceful, it feels beautiful and it's branded with somebody who I perceive to have values or I perceive to look like me and help me be more of who I am or identify and connect in a way that's more of who I am. Then it becomes a question of, do I have the money that, it, that I need to pay for this, to experience this? And that's why I mean when I say people buy based on emotion, but then they back that emotion up with logic. And so when we start thinking about our target market, it becomes really, really important to think about your target customer, how you want to communicate with them, what values you're promulgating through your brand. And it's not only just what my logo says or what my logo did or what my website said and what my website did. It's also what am I saying consistently to this particular customer, potentially on social media? How many times do I have to hit this customer and expose them to marketing material before they decide to make a purchase? And so that requires getting into some things like their demographics and their psychographics in terms of how they think. How much money do they have? How much education do they have? Where do they go? When they go there, what do they do? What's important to these people? Do they care about the environment and sustainability? So we want to start thinking about the target customer in that sense of how we want to try to communicate that message to them. And it's like I stated before, it may take a little bit of discovery since we're talking about art, but you definitely want to try to get into that piece so that you can sell and do more of your art. The other piece is your target market. Your target market, as I spoke mentioned before, is going to be a specific trade area. And in that particular trade area, there are a lot of things happening. You may have some competition there. You may have um, be fulfilling a gap because there's no art.
guess we're gonna wait for her to unfreeze for a minute, but uh, um, I have been dropping some, some links in here. If you guys are interested in um, some of the things that the Arts Council offers, we do have grants and we do have um, a grant that's called the Sally Williams Grant that can help um, creatives take conferences or courses. So, oh, you're back. Okay, I'll let you continue. I'm sorry, you froze again. What's, what, did I froze again? I don't know what's happening today. Okay. What was that? Was I even on, on market? Yes. Okay. Um, so um, I talked about a lot of things. <laughs> um, so what I was talking about is making sure that you understand who your target customer is and how that particular target customer is um, you're able to talk to them and speak to their values um, through your different ways of communicating yourself in the market with your brand, with your communication. And then so um, competitor analysis, so target customer a little bit, but talking about the competitor, um, you know, who's in the market, and um, do what you do and whether or not you're offering something that's more new unique for that particular everything is done prairie you know we would love to be everybody it, it's exhausting for us to try to communicate to everybody and do all things and be one we want to try to narrow it down to a trade area because then that makes it possible for us to speak to one or two or three maybe different customer segments and in speaking to customer segments it's not as exhausting to try to get the message out about who we are and what we do if someone outside the customer segment we appreciate going and um, come and purchase art anyway so anyway when you think about all the things. So your marketing and sales strategy. So the, play, uh, um, so, the so sales strategy piece. I'm like sorry to, talk, to break in, but you're you're um you're freezing and then um getting a weird, I guess robot voice. I don't know. Yeah. Um. Is it is your Wi-Fi strong? Maybe it's an internet connection issue. It's um, up as high as it'll go. Okay. Let's see. I'm sitting right next to it. I wonder. Sound any better now or? Yeah, it does sound some better. Uh, waffly. Um, if you have a bunch of tabs open, that sometimes affects it. I closed them before I started. I think what I'm going to do is turn the video off. Okay. If I can. I can help you all. And then that way, let's see if that makes it different when I. Yeah. Well, the the voice is still weird, but uh, I think it might be better. Uh, try turning, I guess, turning off the PowerPoint too and see if that, that helps. It's definitely some sort of connection issue. Yeah, definitely. And that's so strange. Uh, but well, 
Yeah, it's it's still it's still really bad. Can can we can we close the just close your screen and not share? See if that'll help. Because I mean, at least we could hear you if we if you would to talk. Because I we can't understand you the way you are. I'm sorry. Are you there? <laughs> yes, Scarlett, I'm here. Okay. Source. Am I still waffling? A little bit, yeah. That's so strange. I'm just going to talk a little bit now. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Oh, that was so much I know better. We've lost a couple. Of people. Yeah, well, it's okay. Uh, one of them had a two-year-old she had to to go talk to. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, it won't take me long, just a second. Okay, well, I've also dropped in a YouTube video for, that we did this uh, workshop for uh, social media and marketing techniques um, with MHP, and I dropped that YouTube in here. It was really, actually, really good. I, I learned things, and I've been doing marketing for a while, so maybe you will, too. <laughs> oh, goody, it feels, it feels just like Monday. Um, also, <laughs> also we um, I know that we are planning on a group of workshops, um, everything from taxes to um, actually, you know, using the arts as a healing mechanism for this fall through like January for fall and winter. But if you guys have any ideas of things, uh, we have a survey and I'll drop it in the link, but you get it in the event right too when I send out the recording for this. Um, also, if you want to be able to download the chat, you can go to, or like on the side where we've been just dropping information, you can go to the chat box and click on the three dots next to the smiling man or woman. I'm not sure. Anyway, and then you can just say save chat. And so you can download load all of what we've been saying and use it later. That will help you preserve like the links that, that we've been dropping in here. Um, also, if, if you guys want to connect anyway, it's a, it's a great opportunity to be able to at least just sort of meet. Um, so, so do that. <laughs> okay. Um, and if you have any questions, make sure to go ahead. You can drop them in the chat, raise your hand, or you can email me. I, I dropped my email in earlier. Um, but thank you so much again. And I, hopefully Pamela's ready. Oh, also, uh, I have things. <laughs> um, oh, so she left. It's just me. Okay. <laughs> um, I do have uh, some things coming up. We're going to do all our, our Get Smart workshops in person, but also in hybrid, like virtual hybrid. So I hope that that will be able to connect with more people. Uh, and we're looking at doing maybe one in uh, that's a Spanish and bilingual one. So I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. um, we also have Small Works on Paper that's going to be opening soon. So if you are a visual artist, that might be a great opportunity to get your artwork out there. Um, and we have um, Arts and Education is going on right now. So I think, I think the uh, program for applying for the roster and getting into those sorts of um, um, mini grants 
that ends in July. So you might want to check that out. Our, our website is, of course, Arkansas Arts. And when you are thinking about your business, um, we, we, although we support mostly nonprofit organizations, there are some collaborative opportunities for businesses. And you can probably get into like if you do freelance writing or if you are a musician and you have gigs, we, we have things that can at least help um, and programs that would get you more into the community. I know they're not for people to program, like you're not supposed to come up with a program and then get the grant or something like that. Not really that. You're just not supposed to develop one specifically for a grant. I think that's how it goes. Anyway, that's the business world. You can do that if you want. We have all of that to say. We have some veterans grants that have a rolling uh, deadline, and they are they don't require a match, and it's to help veterans. So if you've ever been interested in helping veterans. Um, heal through music or learn through music or uh, writing, memoir writing, uh, collage, visual arts, anything like that. We have a grant that will, will help that community and uh, hopefully help help you. It pays for, for what your program will be. Anyway, Pamela is back. So hopefully, hopefully it's all better. Um, if you do have questions, definitely feel free to email me. Oops. I don't know my. Anyway. Okay, so sir. Much. Is that better? So much better. Yes. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Um, I think I stopped when um, I started talking about, um, I don't know what the last thing was that you all heard, but I think it was the market. And um, I pretty much beat a dead horse with this when I've talked about all the different pieces. But I do want to tell you that um, I used to work for the ASBTDC and one of the one of the most beneficial services that they offer is the market research. And if you have never worked with the ASBTDC, they are definitely worth um, getting some assistance with market research and business planning. At the Venture Center, we help with kind of that next level of business, um, the growth piece a little bit more, and we do a lot of cohort focused training and uh, services, but the SBTDC will accept anyone as a client and they are great for that market research. And one of the best things about the market research is that you don't have to pay anything out of pocket. It's going, you've already paid for it with your tax dollars. And so it's a service that they can provide once you have established a sound business plan. Now, when we start getting into the market analysis piece, um, you know, one of the things that you really, really want to put some thought into is what's happening in the industry right now, where it is and how it's changing and whether or not people are doing one activity over another? Are they using flyers? Are they using websites? Are they uh, using some type of computer generated digital something? You want to know what those things are and you wanna know what's coming next. Um, one time I had a young man in one of my classes where he had a, a business with drones. And so those drones, he was like, well, I said, well, tell me what hurts your business. What keeps you from doing business in a day? And he says, hey, when it rains, I can't operate my drones. And so after further discussion, one of the things he mentioned was that they are coming out with new drones. And in a situation like that, he found it more beneficial to lease the drones and then so that when they come as they, you know, because technology was moving so fast that as they came out with new products that he would be able to get those instead of investing a $50,000 up front for something that might be outdated the next day. But I'm saying all that to say, you need to know how people sell, what tools they're using, where they're selling their materials at, you know, how they're connecting with other organizations to offer those sales. Um, and because all of that makes a difference in whether or not your people are gonna be able to see you when you come into the market. You wanna think about the finance and, re and uh, regulation, whether or not people are more interested in the arts during the spring, maybe jazz in the park is a, a time when People want to hear more jazz during the spring, you know, or like Christmas lights. They want to put up lights in the Chris in the Christmas time and the, at the end of the year. And so, based on your business and your business type, 
do you find that you sell more products and services at festivals? And if you do, are they only happening during the summer? And so during the winter months, you've got to figure out how to make ends meet. So if there's a cyclical nature to your business, then you want to manage your business in such a way that you can compensate for that. And then also try to mitigate um, that by offering some other type of service during that time of year, potentially. And I know that as an artist, that's maybe, you know, you may find that um, if you're doing visual arts, then you may find that. Um, there are certain times of the year that you can connect with different types of events and there are more philanthropists there. And so therefore you sell more art. But then during the summertime, there are more festivals. And so therefore you sell more caricatures or small trinkets. Um, you may find those types of things. And so be, be mindful of what that looks like. Think about what keeps a manager up at night. If getting a gig keeps a person in your particular industry up at night, you know, how do you mitigate that? How do you keep what you do and who you are in front of the people who can make a decision about whether or not you can get the work? Industry opportunity, what are the industry trends and niches? You need to know those things as well. Where is it, where's everything going? And be prepared because there's nothing worse than starting a new business and offering something to the market and then not being prepared for what's coming next. And so you're only going to be like a shot in the dark, one hit wonder, and we don't want to do that. Um, does the competition mean that there is no market for the product? Okay. It could mean that there, there's nobody who wants to buy that thing in that particular area. Think about your major competitors. You want to make sure you describe them and be able to tell how your product is different, not just when you're thinking about the strategy, but actually, you know, why you can use that as a basis to explain from a communication standpoint why your product is more superior or more uh, beneficial to the market. Okay. What is the competition share on sales? Where are they located? Does their location have something to do with why they're able to sell more? Maybe they're not the highest quality, but maybe they're getting a, a larger quantity because they have more foot traffic or drive-by traffic. Maybe they've put up billboards uh, because people are familiar with trying to learn about that particular industry from billboards. We wanna know all of those things and think about all of those things. Put some of that in your business plan, but when you do, more so so that you can tell the story of why your product is good or why your product is more beneficial. And then you want to talk about your unique differentiators. What makes you different? Why choose your product over another? All right. So some of the key components for um, your market strategy, marketing strategy, which you need to definitely have a marketing strategy. And um, you want to definitely know who that target customer is. And most businesses have about three segments and they focus on those three segments and then until they can see you know where there are, is more traction than one or the other and then you want to think about your customer journey what does a customer have to do to get to you from the time that they find out about you and who you are what do they have to do do they have to I mean, do you have to hit them three times? And when I mean that from a marketing standpoint, they've seen your advertisement once on Facebook, then they've gone to a website they frequently visit um, and seeing your website. And then maybe they went to Brewski's Pub and they saw a flyer for your business. Does it take three times for them to say, oh, this might be something I'm interested in. I, I think I'll do X, Y, Z. I mean, because when we start talking about marketing, that's really what it's about. It's about how many times can I get myself or my product in front of this customer, this potential customer that I've taken the time to research their psychographics and their demographics and all of their other criteria. How many times do I need to get before them before they will decide to take action and buy my product? And so what's the first thing that I want them to do? When they see that flyer, do I want them to go to my website? Do I want, to go, want them to go to my Facebook page? What do I want them to do? 
how easy is it that, that, that they can go ahead and see my art and decide to buy my product? Okay, so think about what that looks like and what it feels for a customer um, to actually consume your art. Define your market position. Where are you coming in? You know, in some cases, you may be the low man on the totem pole, but be realistic about where you are and how you're going to enter the market. Are you going to enter quietly? Are you going to enter with a bang? Are you going to decide to confront and go head to head with your competition? Or are you just going to secretly move around and get everything, um, those customers that they don't? Are you using some type of special customer service that maybe, maybe they're not? I mean, there are different pieces you need to think about there. Um, definitely want to keep generating interest no matter what. You know, I think we get in, can often get into the slump and I'm guilty of it as well of, okay, I'll focus on marketing in January. Then I get real, real busy. And then it's like, oh gosh, it's already May and I need to do some more marketing. But no, you have to have consistent lead generation. And because what's going to happen, you got to, the, your potential customers need to actually be contacted or have your product in front of them. Probably some in, in some cases, it may take up to seven times is what the, what the normal number is for marketing practices. So think about how can I consistently generate and keep interest does that involve me um, doing some type of um, YouTube video? Does that involve me going live on Facebook? Does that involve me doing consistent posts about different tips and tricks from the type of art I provide? Does it involve me keeping my friends, family, and everyone connected to the work that I'm doing in performing arts? What does it take? How do you keep generating interest? And then think about the channels. Channels are just that. Facebook is a channel. The Arkansas Democrat is a channel. Um, some of those flyers that you can put up are different channels. You may even decide that you want to do some other things um, that offer uh, different types of channels for your business. You know, obviously, I wouldn't recommend doing anything over the phone, but that that may be another channel. Different sorts of magazines, um, the different ways in which you may lead generate and work B2B with businesses. Those are all different channels that you can put your message out and your brand out about who you are and what you do. All right, so let's think about the operations plan. Um, the operations plan is, it's pretty much, like I said, it's the, it's the, it's where you actually sit down and say, I've written this business plan. It is going to kind of give a high level overview and some more detailed number projections of what I think will happen. But how am I going to make these number projections happen? I've got this high level verbiage that I can use, but now I need to get down to the nitty gritty of really all of the actions. And what are the actions that I need to take to actually make sure that I reach these numbers? What is the strategy that I need to use to accomplish this goal when I know that there's competition in the market, when I know that there are several moving pieces as it relates to um, not just my finances, but the materials that I need to use, the channels, the distribution points, what am I gonna do? So for example, if I'm a, uh, a visual artist, or let's say I'm a performing artist and I have a music business, Okay, and my goal is to make $50,000 a year. So if I start from zero, then I started at writing down that $24.58 per hour that I'm putting in my business. I started, I also wrote down how much my equipment costs. So if I play the guitar, then I'm gonna think about all of the factors that go into me supporting and playing, I mean, the, the uh, supplies for my guitar. I might even think about microphones. I may even think about, do I need a, a live singer? Do I have to pay for that? You know, I may start thinking about all of those different pieces. And so once I do that, it's like, okay, well, I don't have any gigs. So what's my strategy? My strategy is to make sure that people know that I'm a wonderful guitar player and that I have 
maybe potentially a unique show. So what I can do is who do I know and where do people go that like to hear the type of guitar that I play? How do I start to build up interest about who I am and what I do? Number one, you want to do that by potentially maybe do some YouTube videos, maybe go live on Facebook sometimes and show them, you know, I'm thinking about all of these things I can do, but that's me marketing and promoting my business. But how do I actually make some money? So now I have to lead generate, which means I need to pick up the phone and call venues or people that I can get in front of. There's nothing worse than being a, an artist or having a, a skill or some type of talent. And you go and see your friends and family and they've hired somebody else to do the thing that you do because they didn't know you did it. Yeah. I, oh, Pam. Hey. Oh, yeah. I just bought a house. You just bought a house. Well, you know, I'm a real estate agent. No, I didn't know that. That's painful. So think about the strategy, you know, entering the market may be a little bit challenging, but think about what your strategy is and what actions you will take here. All right, so this is a couple of um, resources, the ASBTDC, and then there's artworkarchive.com. There is also a resource sheet that I'll, I'll have to share with Scarlett and ask her to share with you all. It is on marketing uh, resources and it's free. Uh, so before you work with an organization like the ASBTDC, you will work with, um, you can do some preliminary research on your own with things like the census.gov um, or, you know, there's a organization called Trend Watch. There's one called Trend Hunting. Uh, there's Esri. There are quite a few that you can go on and start trying to do some of your own research to find out more about your business so that you can complete your business plan draft. The ASBTDC has something on their website called the To The Point Business Plan Outline. And in the To The Point Business Plan Outline, it breaks down um, five different areas and, you know, it's really, really simple because it's meant to be quality over quantity and it is an eight to 10 page business plan where you will write out, you know, those sections that we talked about. Um, and, you know, the, what I've added differently from theirs is the operations plan, the description of the business, and then some of the information on the market analysis. And, you, if you use their tool, it can help you get a draft started. Now, here's also what I'm going to recommend. You let that help you get a draft started, but then you go to artworkarchive.com or some place that's specific for artists and get yourself that foundational information that they're, they're, you know, suggesting that you put in a business plan for art business. Um, it's very, very comprehensive. They've got a whole guide that I think can help you to um, get started and get on the right track. But then once you've got a really good draft, work with the ASBTDC to get someone to help you refine that business plan, especially if you're going to seek any type of bank funding. And once you've done that, they'll during that process, they will give you access to market research at no cost. There are a lot of beneficial services there um, that I think that, you know, regardless of what type of business you have that you could benefit from, but definitely from our business. So what questions you guys got from me? I have one. Um, do you have... Do you have a, any of your resources have like um, funding for starting up businesses, grants, any kind of, um, I mean, woman owned maybe or minority, anything? So, you know, the ASBTDC, they have um, some opportunities there. They're not particularly grants, I would say, but they have resources that are available for um, underserved groups through their navigators program. Um, and so that they, they do have some resources available, but 
as it relates specifically to grants, uh, I would say that I the Women's Foundation uh, Remix Ideas is a really, really good one. Um, Remix Ideas is on the campus of the Central Arkansas Library System. And basically they have a maker space in the building. So I don't know what your product is, but they do have a maker space for, you know, things like digital screen printing and sewing and a few other kind of artist driven um, things. But they also are a uh, entrepreneur support organization and they are for the black and brown community for the most part, but they assist everyone. They support everybody in the, in the effort to start a business in Arkansas, but through um, what's called a, a, the a money fund. There's an opportunity to get loan funding if your business is viable because they use non-traditional credit sources. Um, they're going to look at more of your character and the cash flow of your business than uh, your credit score. And so there's some opportunity there. Um, they also have uh, another piece that they call advanced and black businesses and black business and they do grants uh, on a regular basis through that particular organization. There is also um, a couple of other things popping up here in Little Rock. I don't know if you guys know about Kiva. It is not just it's not particularly art focused, but again, it's more of a loan program than it is a grants program. The Women's Foundation of Arkansas, they provide grants and they help several cohorts of business owners per year. So there, there are, I don't know, I've, I've, re, I've kind of rattled off a, a list, but it, it's quite a few. What about the, the small Arkansas Small Business Bureau or their administration? Yeah. So the SBA, you know, they, they provide, you know, loan guarantee, but they don't provide grants per se. And what what are we want, hoping that the grants are used for? More like a commission type thing? What are we looking for on the grant piece? I mean, uh, maybe help starting up. I mean, that's the biggest cost, I would think. So in terms of the starting up piece, um, I want to I want to caution everybody where the grants are concerned. Um, usually, grants are more specific towards helping an organization meet its goals. Usually, now every now and then one will come along where they've you know got some extra funding. Like I said, the Women's Foundation or the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation will do a contest or something. But usually if you start kind of peeling back the layers, they're trying to research or advance the goals that they have as an organization. And so it can potentially take you out of the place of where you are, but then it could also be beneficial. It's just that they kind of come few and far in between. And so, um, I, I, I would I would be careful with the grant piece in terms of starting. I would I would there there are other ways to to get started. Sometimes we have to start a little bit smaller than we want to. Um, but it but it but it, it it's sometimes it's more beneficial to start that way. It just depends. Grants are very hard to get. How beneficial is it to work with your local chamber of commerce? Very. So let me talk about the chamber of commerce piece a little bit. The chamber of commerce, the whole goal, you know, we're here in Little Rock, most of us, but, but the chamber of commerce has a goal of trying to advance the economics in an area. And so you will see them with their hand in a lot of different things, everything from the education of children to, um, you know, how some property at some area downtown may be treated because it's in a, a main street uh, area uh, when they're and they're trying to do main street revitalization that sort of thing um, you'll see them heavily involved in trying to recruit businesses to try to come into an area to um, create more jobs for people and so when we start talking about the chamber, there is a level of politics involved, no doubt, no, no way around that, um, because this, they're dealing with everything from 
um, our waterways to our economics um, in terms of job recruitment and so forth. But one of the benefits of, of being part of a chamber, I feel like, is, is that you have the networking opportunity that puts you in connection with other chamber members. And sometimes those businesses, although titled as small businesses, the way that the SBA has distinguished small businesses can mean up to 400 employees for some organizations based on the industry. And it's it's very, it varies so much that like I, there's no carte blanche answer to that piece of it. But what I'm trying to say is, is the ability to get your art in front of people, the ability to um, build that relationship with your local chamber, because, you know, then, then you may be that person that they recommend or that they um, try to connect with someone makes a difference. So my, my thing is, is that if you join a local chamber and you start trying to build a relationship and you don't see benefit of it after over time, I wouldn't continue. Um, but I think that if, if it, if you've got the right relationship and you have it as part of your strategy that it could be lucrative. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> it, it does. Um, and I, I do have uh, one more. I was thinking about like angel investors or silent investors. Um, is there a good way to go about recruiting people that might be able to help you fund your, your business or maybe even Kickstarter? I don't know. Yeah, so crowdfunding is one of those areas. I have to admit, like, I know that it's an option. And, and that's one of the reasons why I tried to kind of touch on that storytelling piece when we first started, because I, again, you know, you're marketing, you're artists, like there is so much of who, what, the products that you're selling, it's so much of you. Like you're the brand, you're that person. And so adding a story or a narrative to that can sometimes be the difference between a person wanting to give a dollar and a person wanting to give 25. Because you gotta remember, we make decisions with our emotions, then we back it up with logic. So when we connect with somebody, it's like value connecting with value and something allowing us to be more of who we really are. And so um, that story narrative piece, like there's so much opportunity in that for, for artists. I think, I think about, um, I can't remember the young lady who became the uh, first black principal ballet for the New York now, somebody, I don't know, I'm going to butcher it really bad. But I mean, I think about the fact that I wouldn't know who she is if it wasn't for her story. I would know nothing about her. And, I, and so what I'm trying to say to you is like, that narrative piece is so human, and art is so human that that is that is an area that would be so beneficial. But when it so, so I think crowdfunding, Kickstarter, things like that, how well, you can share a narrative and how, I guess, also set goals in case, you know, depending on if this is the type that takes your money and you don't reach your goal. But um, you want to you wanna try to make sure you tell a story that you can connect and get people to appeal to, to who you are and, and buy into your business. As it relates to angel investors, angel investors, they want to put money in fast and get money out fast period. And then they're going to, there, it's going to be high stakes. They're going to want to um, get more on the front end. Just kind of like if you went to the bank to get a mortgage and you're paying like, why am I paying $300 on $20,000? I'm confused. It's because the bank front loads that interest. Well, angel investors front load interest as well. And so when they front load interest like that, um, it, it can make it challenging for a business owner, an artist. But what I want to say is, is we do have local investors here. Um, I don't know, David Moody, he was previously with the SBA, but he has something called the Angel Investors Network. And um, based on what type of business you have, if those numbers show that they can get their money that quickly, if they put money into it, it may be an option for you. Does anybody have any questions or am I just going to continue to ask all of the questions? <laughs> so one, one of the things that I want to say, you know, 
I think I just kind of did when I talked about that artist to narrative piece, because like that's so it's so much there. Like I I know that's not what we're here to talk about today, per se. But I, I do feel like that is a, a very, very important part of talking about who you are and what you do in branding yourself. And um, branding yourself and being authentic and getting that out there consistently has the ability to consistently bring in leads. Okay. And, and so if you're able to do that, then I think that is going to be a very, very important part of your business. But as, as, as it relates to business planning, that, that marketing strategy that we kind of talked about, that's kind of where that falls. So, so spend some time thinking about that piece. When you write your business plan, again, like I said, the ASBTDC and there may be other organizations and other um, templates available for you online. You just go through and take your time and write each one of those sections. It doesn't matter how dirty it is. Think about it in terms of writing different iterations, you know, because you might think, well, I'm a horrible writer. That first draft looks like crap, but guess what? That's okay. Next time when you come back to it three days later or four days later with a different set of eyes and you keep making those different iterations, you'll get it to a place you want it to be. Just be willing to devote the time. That's all I got. Well, um, well, I do have one more question before you go. Um, I was wondering, this seems really overwhelming. Is it a, is. Okay. <laughs> it just seems super overwhelming. Is there a way to sort of tackle this? Like piece by piece. So you break, you, you, you definitely do it piece by piece. Um, you start thinking about, okay, well, what is my company? You know, you may think, oh, well, I'm selling widgets and then you're like oh my gosh but I'm actually providing a service because not only am I selling widgets I'm telling people how to use them you know so you want to really really get down into this you know you want a company description and you want to be clear about what that is I think you want to be clear about who you are what do you bring to the table and how 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 are you going to utilize everything that you are to make this business a success I think that that part plays. So when you start writing that company description, write the company description, write the product, know exactly what it is that you're providing, you know, determine whether or not you need to go and get a business license or an LLC or whatever the case may be for the city or county that you live in. You know, you want to know, you want to start getting into those pieces. But then if you, if you, once you do that, research on your target customer. Like just one little piece at a time, just do it one little piece at a time. And if you can't find what you need to figure out that financial piece, um, again, the ASBTDC, a one-on-one -on -one consulting um, piece can help with that. So they try to make it easier. I'm not saying that it is because you still got to do the thinking. You still got to put the work behind it, but um, it can't just bite by bite. Well, um, does anybody, I guess we're going to wrap up a little bit early. Does anybody have any questions at all? Um, now's the time. I will send out a, a link so that you can watch this video uh, again for a certain amount of time. Um, and I guess if, if not, um, if you guys don't have anything else, uh, we'll just sign off. So thank you everyone for coming and thank you, Pamela, for, for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, so, and y'all have yeah. a really great Monday. Like, <laughs> happy Monday, everybody. Thank yeah. you. Bye. See you soon. See you.